Hello Beer Geeks and welcome to Beer Flavours and where they come from. I know it sounds like a game show, but actually it's a very geeky video about the four ingredients of beer and the amazing flavours that they can create when put together. Now I'm sure that you, as a beer lover, if you're anything like me, have had a new beer put in front of you, you've given it a smell, you've given it a taste and you've gone, huh, that's a slightly unusual flavour. Maybe it was chocolate, maybe it was banana, maybe it was salt, whatever it was, maybe it was grass. You have possibly wondered what in that beer could be giving off that flavour and that's what this video is all about, looking at the key ingredients and working out what flavours come from where. How have I got all of this stuff in front of me and all I can smell is clove? So let's start with the absolute basics. So there are four main ingredients that go into beer and they are listed here. We've got the malt, which adds the sugar that we need to ferment to make alcohol. We've got the hops that add bitterness and aroma and flavor. We've got the yeast that ferments the sugar from the malt to create alcohol. And then we've got water, which uh, makes it wet uh, and also does other things which we'll get into at the end of this. Now, all of these things contribute huge amounts of flavor, character, of even like body, so the actual thickness of the liquid that we're drinking. And we're gonna dive into how all of them do it individually, and then also how, through science, they come together and create other flavors through heat, through time, and through actual chemical reactions going on. Now we're gonna start with the malt for one very simple reason, and that is that regardless of the beer style, there will always be some malt character in your beer. That's not really true of hops or even yeast. Uh, well, maybe, maybe there's some water character in all of these, but malt is the one that really, for me, kind of defines what a beer is gonna be, that malt kind of character. And malt has a huge range of character that it can add to your beer. So down here, I've got chocolate, I've got bread, I've got honey, I've got McVitie's digestive biscuit, other biscuits are available, and then I've got coffee, and I've got dates. Now this is by no means an exclusive list of all the flavors that you can get from, from malt in your beer, but this kind of starts to represent all of the different flavors that we get. So we've done a video already about how malt is made. Essentially it is barley, or it's possibly wheat, or it's possibly, I don't know, buckwheat, or it could be spelt. It could be lots of different grains, but predominantly it's barley. And we've talked about the malting process when we went up to see Montans in Norfolk, one of the best producers. So you can learn all about the processes of making malt up here, but as a result of the kilning process, so that's where you slowly heat these malts to certain temperatures, you can achieve, much like you know, using a toaster, different levels of brown. All the shades of brown are visible in malt and indeed on this table. So you start off with the lighter characters. So you can get kind of just digestive biscuit, a sweet, malty, uh, rich, full, biscuity kind of character. And alongside that, you can also end up with kind of bready character. So you could end up with brown bread, with seeds, all these kind of notes. Remember, you know, there's probably barley on the edges of this somewhere. Um, and that can add depth as well, while remaining very light in terms of any kind of roast character. Now also, and this is very common in German Pilsners, you can get honey. So honey is a really, really sweet flavor, but it definitely comes out in the pale, particularly continental styles and the continental malts. Those are the malts, the barleys that are grown, say in the Czech Republic uh, or in Germany. So these are often found in the base malt flavors. So the base malts are the malts that give the alcohol to the beer. Um, and you'll find that this kind of flavor and these kind of uh, malts that create it make up 60, 70, 80, even 90 or 100% of the amount of malt in a bill. Now, as that kilning process in the malting process gets hotter, you'll start to create more roasty flavors. So you could go through milk chocolate, which I have here, it's Easter, so that's an Easter egg. Or you can go even darker, you can get into dark chocolate where you'll start to get really almost bitter, dark fruits, which leads us on to dates, which is a very common flavor that I get uh, particularly in Belgian beers, where a, a small amount of, of roasted or darker kind of caramelized malts are used. So you'll get sweet, but dark kind of flavors. You could also talk about figs, prunes, all those kind of flavors. But dates is a really common one for me, particularly when there's a lot of sweetness left over in the beer. And then once you get to really dark flavors, the malt will start to provide the dark chocolates or indeed the coffee kind of notes. So that can be really aromatic. It can be full of red berry and uh, different kind of notes like that, and obviously dark chocolate. 
but it can also just add that really rich burnt toast, roasted coffee kind of notes. And that comes from roasted barley, uh, from Carafa 3, from malts that have spent a lot of time at a high temperature in a kiln after the malting process has finished. So to summarize, any kind of flavor in which you're getting biscuity, bready, honeyed kind of notes, that's probably coming from pale malts. If you're getting chocolate, figs, dates, prunes, or coffee, burnt toast rather than bread, brown toast instead of bread, then you're probably talking about speciality malts, malts that have been kilned at a higher temperature and are providing that kind of more rich, kind of umami kind of flavors. But that is all coming from malted barley, from malted wheat, from malted buckwheat, from malted spelt. All of these different flavors will be coming from the malt. Okay, so next up we're gonna be talking about yeast. And we've talked about the process of creating and indeed the role of yeast in beer in a video where we went to Austria and visited Lallemann, one of the premier producers of brewer's yeast in the world. And yeast's role is to eat up the sugar that's brought by the malt. And in doing so, in turning that sugar into alcohol and actually into uh, carbon dioxide as well, which helps carbonate the beer, it also produces lots of different flavors, almost as a, as a byproduct, much like humans, sweat or maybe when they eat they they might fart uh yeast creates lots of unusual aromas as it ferments and i've got a couple of examples down here so again we've got breadiness it's worth remembering that yeast is obviously most famous uh, for raising bread um, and you can get a real doughiness from the yeast. I mean, if you crop fresh yeast off of a, a fermenter like the one behind me, it will smell pretty strongly of bread and that can still get through to the beer. And there's lots of beautiful beers, particularly lagers that can have you know, a slight doughiness to them and best bitters actually in the UK. But on top of that, you get some really unusual flavors. So I've got pear here. Pear is a really common uh, flavor that comes from fermentation. Um, and it, yeah, it smells like really fresh pear or pear drops. So almost kind of synthetic kind of flavors. And that's just a chemical that's produced as a byproduct. Apple is another one, acetaldehyde. Uh, you'll find that really commonly in Belgian beer as well. In a lot of fermentations, it's an off flavor. It's a bit distracting from the, the hop stuff that we're going to talk about later. But in really small doses, it can add a freshness um, to beer. And again, that's just a chemical created as part of the fermentation process. We've then got banana. This is the smallest banana in the world. Um, and this uh, is a very specific aroma that is mostly found in Belgian wet beers and, of course, German Weiss beers. Just another chemical created during fermentation of certain yeast strains. And then, of course, if we're talking about vice beers, we've got to talk about clove, which is the smelliest thing on this board. And now, to me, that either smells like bread sauce at Christmas uh, or like German vice beers. So that is actually a, a fennel, subtly different to an ester. Um, these are the two kind of chemical families that come off as part of fermentation. Um, and you'll get that in lots of Belgian beers as well. Particularly all of these, the warmer you ferment your yeast, the more of these kind of flavors you're gonna get. So that's why you don't get so many of these real kind of what we call top notes. So very aromatic and in high quantities way too much. Um, that's why you don't tend to get those in lagers. Um, another one which we don't really talk enough about uh, in beer is pepper, which can definitely come off of certain fermentations, certain yeast strains, and adds a really lovely kind of bite to beer. Very common in saisons, more kind of white pepper. It's a little bit softer, a little bit spicier than black pepper. The final flavor that I want to talk about uh, when it comes to yeast is actually gonna be borrowed from the hop section. So here I have a peach. Um, and actually, increasingly, we're getting kind of peach, stone fruit, apricot kind of flavors from our yeasts. And that's because certain yeasts that produce this are used heavily in New England style beers to really amp up that really kind of fruit salad kind of vibe. But actually, it comes from a British yeast. So you'll also find uh, lots of peachy kind of notes in British bitters. And indeed, the first sort of New England IPAs made by like the Alchemist uh, were made using an old British yeast and so those yeasts have sort of been uh, cropped off and the best ones, the ones that produce the most kind of fruit salad kind of notes are now being used in New England. So that could sit in the yeasty section, but actually it's gonna fit in the hop section as we talk about probably everyone's favorite ingredient in beer, but by no means the only important one. So now we're gonna be talking about hops. These amazing flowers, uh, they flower in September, they're plucked off the vine. Sometimes they're just thrown straight into the brew, in which case you'll probably get lots and lots of grassy notes of pine, of floral characters, so literally different flowers, rose, all these kind of aromas, or they might be dried, 
potentially pelletize to remove some of the kind of the, the vegetal matter and get more of the lovely delicious uh, essential oils. Essential oils are basically very delicate oils that smell of certain things. They're used in perfumes. You'll find them in the skin of apples and pears and oranges and peaches, uh, in coffee. Um, and all you're doing is, is kind of distillating that down so you get as many oils as possible that you're adding to your beer with less bitterness, less vegetal, less grassy kind of character. I say less grassy kind of character, there's lots of reasons why you might want grass. In uh, pale lagers you'll get grassiness, in lots of British beers you'll get grassiness, and it adds a savoury character to balance out, say, the malt and some fruity yeasts. So you can definitely get grass. You can also, sort of the American version of grassiness, is pine. Uh, I think this was my Christmas tree from December. Um, so this is a really common characteristic in American hopped beers, those grown on the Pacific Northwest, and you'll get literally Christmas tree kind of uh, smells and indeed sort of pine resin as well. So a little bit stickier, sweeter, but still with that really woody kind of vibe. So pine is really common and it kind of makes sense. These hops are grown, they are plants themselves. So it's we're bound to get kind of plant matter, plant aromas from them. Um, and then we get to the juicier kind. So here I have a lovely orange. Uh, this is representing all the citrus fruits. So it could be lemon, it could be orange, it could be any kind of like pithy, slightly bitter, but incredibly aromatic and sweet and sometimes juicy kind of fruits. And that comes again from those essential oils that are in there and certain hops are selected that have high levels of this. Like orange is highly associated with the Amarillo hop, which is a beautiful hop when used in small quantities to add that kind of pithiness. Uh, hell, even in big quantities, what am I talking about? So then we've got peachiness, and lots of the really modern hops, the ones just coming out of the hop breeding programs in the States, are looking for stone fruit character to really amp up the stone fruits that we're getting from the English uh, yeasts in uh, New England IPA. So that's kind of what people are going for. More juice, always more juice, dial up the juice, 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 can't say juice enough when it comes to New England IPAs or indeed to very modern American hops. But before that, uh, we were able to get in high quant when we really dry hop heavily, starting to get these kind of things. So this is dried mango, it could be papaya, it could be passion fruit, these more kind of tropical notes um, that remind us of, of summer holidays, of suntan lotion, of pina coladas, all these kind of summery holiday kind of flavours that are so powerful and nostalgic, have done really, really well in the craft beer industry, whether it's New England IPA, West Coast IPA, whether it's golden ales, like little session sippers now, we're all looking for kind of tropical fruit notes um, to come out of our hops, and hops are being selected to really enhance these two kinds of flavours. Which leads me to my final point about these three parts of the beer brewing process, which is that they all interact with each other uh, during the brew day, so during the mash, which is when you heat up the grain and get the sugars, during the boil, which is when you boil it and add the hops, and then during the fermentation, which is when you add the yeast and ferment out that sugar. All of those are chemical processes. When you're boiling stuff, you're releasing essential oils and you're releasing the bitterness um, from the hops. When you're mashing the malt, you're not just extracting sugar, you're changing uh, the chemical uh, structures that are within that, you're breaking down different chemicals to create different flavours. And then with yeast, you're producing flavours, so you're actually releasing all of these organic chemicals that all taste of different things, as well as creating carbon dioxide and alcohol, and that's where we get this from. But then they start to interact. So there's a, a process called biotransformation, which can happen when you hop, uh, ad hops during fermentation, uh, the yeast will break down flavour compounds in the hops to create new flavours, which is actually one of the ways that you can increase the juicy juice juice juiceness. Even if there's no actual chemical change going on, you can use certain flavours from the key ingredients here to influence others, either to heighten them, to make them seem more complex, or to mellow them out. Say we've got a wonderful certain variety of coffee that's been roasted in a certain way and it's presented with lots of cinnamon or maybe some kind of citrus character. You could use Amarillo hops to really heighten that citrus character or a specific yeast that has clove or pepper or vanilla kind of character coming out of it that will help to heighten that kind of sweet, rich coffee idea. You could also use orange to create a Terry's chocolate orange without actually ever using anything other than hops. You can, as we do all the time in New England IPA, use a juicy yeast, a juicy uh, modern British yeast, along with a really modern juicy American hop to some make something that's just an all-out hop assault. So without even changing the chemistry, we can 
basically play tricks with people's minds and play around with the flavors that we have to create nostalgia and make them recognize other different ingredients that aren't in the beer and that they're just reminded of. Now this influence that all these different ingredients have on each other finally leads us to the last corner of the table. So water, like I said, is over 90% of what's actually in the beer, but in terms of the flavors that it adds, it's pretty small. And the reason that I put salt on there is because perhaps the most famous way that water adds flavor to beer is through a heavy salting rate. So if you add enough salt into beer, you'll start to obviously taste that. And that is key to the Gosa style, a sour German beer, which is salty, lemony, wheaty kind of crackery. It's an incredibly refreshing beer and also a great base for adding fruit to. Um, but that's probably the only way in which water is really tasted. But what water can do is completely change how the other flavors pop out. So if you add certain amounts um, of calcium, of, of chlorides, then you can really amp up the kind of malt character. You can make the beer feel thicker, fuller, sweeter, and that's used in New England IPAs. If you really raise the sulfates in it by adding certain chemicals, you can enhance the hoppiness, you enhance the bitterness, the pithiness, the pininess, the kind of really sharp flavors in there. And also water chemistry is incredibly important for yeast health. So you need to have magnesium and other uh, vitamins, minerals in there that will help the yeast stay healthy and produce either exactly the flavors you want or as few flavors as possible if you're making something like a, like a lager or a West Coast IPA where it's really all about one of these. So I really hope that's clarified maybe when you pick up a beer where those flavors are coming from. Don't forget to like and subscribe and down below in the comments I would love to hear about the weirdest flavors you've got out of beer or any flavors that you don't know where it came from and you can't quite describe. Hit me up there and I will do my best to answer all of your questions about where flavor comes from in beer.